And next up, Richard Massey, who is leaving the bounds of this Earth. <laughs> and going to talk about balloon telescopes, super bit. Uh, yeah, uh, well, let me plug this in first. At the risk of contradicting my uh, colleague from Durham, I have to say that Kieran did miss off one way of, of overcoming the Earth's atmosphere, which is um, perhaps for, for us more uh, simplistic people, the easier approach, and uh, that is just to go uh, over the Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> Okay, so it's getting late, so I'm going to uh, uh, play a little video to uh, keep you awake before, uh, before tea time. I wanted, to, for my science, wanted to have wide field blue imaging um, with a very small but very stable and particularly very well-known PSF. And at Durham, we got fed up of not being allowed to use Hubble for 100% of the time, or we got fed up with waiting for uh, JWST, pretty you know, reasonable things to, uh, to ask. So we thought we'd build our own space telescope. Well, we couldn't afford to build anything that actually launched on a rocket. That, well, that is more complicated. That's rocket science, right? But um, we could take this alternative approach. So we assembled this telescope uh, that was on an unusual mount uh, most importantly of which, it has a hook at the top of it. Uh, this is a, uh, a half-metre telescope at the moment, and uh, here it is being lifted up on, on the back of a, um, a crane in the middle of Texas by that hook on the top of it, and uh, left in the middle of a launch pad until the wind goes, uh, goes still. And when there's a gap in, uh, in any wind blowing, then we inflate a giant balloon by the side of it. The balloon is about the size of a couple of buses, a giant helium balloon, uh, when it's on the ground, but that has a long, long... Uh, in fact, most of this is balloon. It's just empty at the moment. Here's a view from the, uh, from the telescope looking upwards. Uh, as that balloon goes up, it expands and expands as it gets into the rarefied air until it's about the size of a, a small football stadium at an altitude of about 35 or 40 kilometres. So that carries that telescope up into the stratosphere, and there's a balloon there, it's got a parachute on it, and then the telescope parachute, so we can get it back at the end of the day. And then it, uh, it goes up above the clouds, above, in fact, 99.9% .9 of the Earth's atmosphere, to the point where it's effectively in space. Here's a camera on it looking down to the, the night city lights above Texas. Uh, we didn't know, actually, how, how much buffeting it would get uh, when it was in the, in the stratosphere. It turns out the models of the stratospheric uh, winds aren't, aren't, weren't, at least, very well known. But uh, we have a system whereby we can stabilise the balloon as it's uh, sort of on a big, big balloon and then a rope and then a telescope. We can stabilise the telescope until it's uh, pointing and very, very stably <laughs> and then drop it again. Hope that the parachute opens, which it actually hasn't for one telescope once. But uh, hopefully the parachute opens and it comes back down to Earth, at which point we can uh, uh, recover it, repair it, upgrade it without the need for any sort of uh, space shuttle that goes up to, uh, to repair, the, uh, repair a mirror or you know, put on board a spectrograph or anything like that until someone comes along and collects it and turns it off. So why do we do this? Why go to all those lengths of uh, building a telescope just to uh, fling it up on the end of a party balloon? Well, it's because above 99.9% .9 of the Earth's atmosphere, you are effectively in space in terms of seeing there is uh, no seeing, you can be, be diffraction limited, and in terms of transmission, you are then almost in space, at least above uh, the um, <coughs> ozone cutoff at about 300 nanometers. This is the transmission curve at sea level, uh, then above that the transmission curve at the top of uh, Mauna Kea. <coughs> in blue is what you get if you go up to 35 uh, kilometers, where the balloon floats around. And we can get there not on a international agency budget, but on the budget of a university that is uh, uh, reachable. <coughs> Why we want to do that now is that there has been some very fancy new materials technology that lets balloons be a lot more efficient or a lot more useful than they used to be. Old balloons, so, so balloon um, astronomy has been around for quite a long time. In fact, the UK had a world-leading program of ballooning in the 1980s. And uh, 
many countries have been using this, which even until recently, until uh, eight or ten years ago, uh, were exclusively balloons which were open at the bottom. So they were full of helium, and then they won't go up, and during the day they, they warm up and the helium expands, so they go up in altitude. This is a, a diurnal cycle of the, the altitude of a balloon over a couple of days. As the helium expands, the balloon goes up, and then at night time it, it goes down again. It goes up, and every time the, the helium expands, a little bit of the helium leaks out the bottom. So the, at, the end of the, uh, at, the, at the end of the night, you also have to drop a bit of uh, ballast to try and keep this going, keep this from just coming down eventually. But there's only a finite amount of ballast you can carry, so typically balloons would float for a few days. Now recently, uh, NASA had some advances in materials technology, and particularly the, the way that you make the seams in a balloon, that meant that they could close up the bottom of the balloon. And even as the helium expand, oh, heats up and tries to expand, this, uh, these balloons, which are known as superpressure balloons, just get a pressure greater than that of the, of the atmosphere around them. They don't pop, basically. And uh, the altitude as a function of time, for those, just stays pretty constant, because they, they have a, a fixed volume. But because they don't need helium, rather than staying up for a few days, they can stay up for a few months at a time. And that's what makes it worthwhile, having invested all the time and effort into building a telescope with a hook on it, to send it up not just for a few, few, for a few nights, but for a few months. Some of the earliest flights uh, that were sent up went from Antarctica. This is a track of one which orbited around the South Pole several times for uh, just over 50 days. That was the first uh, superpressure balloon. Uh, now, NASA have a new uh, program where they launch from New Zealand. And if you launch, launch at certain times of the year, there are pretty stable high altitude winds, so they just drift around and around the Earth, hopefully. In this case, it went around just once. Uh, they've now had a couple of uh, circuits and one that stayed up for, for about 50 days. But the target is there's no reason why it shouldn't stay up for 100 days. And uh, the uh, the, the cool thing about this, actually, is that you can have very, quite a, a substantially large payload in these, uh, in these balloons, which are, as I say, the size of a small football stadium. They can lift a lot of, uh, a lot of mass. So we've done just that. We've built this telescope, which goes up to 40 kilometers. And then we encounter the main problem with having a telescope which is on the end of a piece of string, which is that it's a giant pendulum and it's swinging around. So this isn't sort of normally faced by most telescopes, which at least just sit there at the top of a mountain and, and stay, stay fairly still. This one really is, uh, is swinging. We didn't know, actually, how much it was going to, uh, to swing. If there had been a lot of turbulence in the upper atmosphere, perhaps it could have been swinging by, uh, by quite a lot. It turns out that there isn't actually all that much, and that uh, once you've st stopped it, once it's sort of steadied, then it, uh, it continues, to continues to be driven uh, with about uh, an arc minute RMS uh, uh, pendulation. Um, that's still obviously no good for uh, uh, optical imaging. If you are uh, trying to get diffraction limited imaging, then swinging backwards and forwards by one arc minute means that you've got some motion blur on your camera. So we have three steps of, uh, of trying to refine this and get uh, better pointing stability. Firstly, just passive, uh, passive damping on the, uh, on the, on the hooks. Uh, but then also, crucially, the telescope is built inside a, a rather unusual mount. The hook is at the top. It's an unusual bit because it can't point directly upwards, but nonetheless, it can, uh, it's roughly alt as and can point out the side. And this is controlled just with um, um, gyroscopes and then frameless, uh, frameless motors which move it backwards and forwards, so whenever the telescope gondola swings to the left, it points to the right a little bit, and whenever it swings to the right, it points left a little bit. That gets us down to about an arc second RMS, residual pointing stability. And then finally, it's a first order adaptive optics, we have a, a fast tip -tilt, mil tip tilt mirror in the optical path, which uh, watches a guide star and uh, corrects the final um, swinging of the telescope by keeping the optical, uh, optical path perfectly still. This is designed to go down to about 20 milli arc seconds RMS, and we've achieved that for a few uh, uh, a, a couple of minutes at a time. Uh, we can achieve 50 milli arc seconds quite, uh, quite comfortably 
uh, as a as long duration, and that is uh, that is sort of well well within our uh, diffraction limit at the moment. But crucially, this isn't a space telescope, so we don't have to freeze the design of it two decades in advance of launch. In fact, uh, we went out the, um, uh, a few months before, our last flight bought a new camera, uh, wired it in, and uh, we could use uh, any of the, the, the latest CCDs from ETV, for example, thank you. Um, in fact, we were going to use one for a while. Uh, we can use any of the latest detectors and uh, adapt things very much at the last minute. In fact, uh, some of the footage that you saw earlier was from a GoPro that we'd nipped down to Best Buy that morning and thought, oh, wouldn't it be a great idea if we uh, uh, gaffer taped a GoPro to the side of it? And uh, <laughs> yes, it turns out you can film, film space quite easily. But uh, we've, because we've been able to use late, um, recent cameras, we've got uh, quite sensitive and particularly uh, very wide field of view cameras with lots of, lots of pixels. And our survey speed is actually, it turns out, slightly faster than, than Hubble's, even with our, with our small um, aperture size for the moment. Uh, so it's very just by getting, by the sheer dint of having a very large field of view. It, this has a real niche, though, because as soon as Hubble dies, which it inevitably will, there is going to be no way of getting high-resolution optical on ultraviolet imaging or spectroscopy from above the Earth's atmosphere. All of these future missions are infrared only, and uh, there, there are going to be whole fields of science which uh, come crashing to an end. Unless, that is, we have some way of replacing that, and this is what we're going for with uh, Superbit. It fills a niche in the optical and UV end of the spectrum. So this, for example, is the, the depth as a function of, uh, as a function of wavelength, that Euclid will survey. Now, admittedly, that is most of the sky, 20,000 square degrees or something, but uh, it doesn't have any optical uh, imaging except a very red, near-infrared uh, band with a very broad, broad filter. We could get multicolor imaging all the way down to the, uh, to the near UV to complement that for many science purposes, from star formation to photometric redshifts to uh, galaxy morphology and evolution, all these things. We're actually being um, encouraged by NASA to not only have our half-metre one that we've built, but to submit a proposal to upgrade that to a two-metre-class telescope, which is the, at the, about the largest that you could lift with the weight limits of the, uh, of the balloons that exist, to try and actually literally replace Hubble. And you could do anything with this that Hubble could do, is the idea. With a two-metre aperture and much greater étendue, you could actually complement W first, which, again, infrared only, uh, but gets much deeper. You could do this with, with a, a two-metre class super bit. Of course, LSST is down there as well. I think that's actually LSST, but, uh, but it's seeing limited. We're above the Earth's atmosphere, so we're uh, not limited in that way. Just to show that it does work, here is a very famous image I'm sure you've all seen before, uh, ultraviolet and UV composites. We can do the same, with because uh, sure enough, anything that Hubble could do, we could do the same. And here is the image of the same thing from Superbit, but not with just that small field of view, of course, with our much larger modern camera field of view. So where have we flown this? We have, at the moment, had three test flights. We've had... Uh, first one in Canada, although the UK uh, Space Agency has, has well, the SDFC has given up on uh, ballooning until recent times, many other countries have Canada, France and the US have kept going, so uh, we've flown with the Canadian Space Agency in CNES for the first flight in 2015, then we had a couple of flights uh, from a NASA facility in Texas, we didn't have one in 2017 because there were big hurricanes in Texas and it turns out that having a a balloon the size of a house in a hurricane is not a good idea. Um, actually, we were, it turns out we've already had Brexit mentioned today. We've been uh, scuppered by Trump as well this year, uh, in that the uncertainty of the government shutdown has meant that we're not going to fly from Texas this year either. Uh, but the Canadian Space Agency have been very excitedly announced that, hey, if NASA can't do it, we're very pleased to. Uh, and uh, so they've, uh, they've stepped in, and we've just had announced this week that we're going to, uh, we might as well, have a, a test flight from... Uh, from Canada uh, 
it's going to be actually a, a two-night flight that we're hoping for so we can get even more, uh, uh, we, can, we can test our daytime operations as well. The purpose for all of this is because we've built up, we are the next uh, mission scheduled to be on NASA's next ultra-long duration balloon flight, which is flying from New Zealand and hopefully going several times around the globe uh, now, <laughs> next year. Thank you, Trump. <coughs> what can we do on this, uh, on this flight? Well, this is the photo that you've uh, already seen from just a, a still frame from that video. And we get fantastic uh, uh, seeing and, and sky background, at least when you look away from the Earth's atmosphere and once the sun has set, uh, this is what you see. The one thing you can't do from a balloon is to look up at zenith. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out there's something in the way. But even with that, uh, you can, uh, if you're flying uh, at the, at the um, longitude of, uh, uh, latitude of, uh, uh, of New Zealand, if you fly for uh, three months around the globe a few times, you can actually observe anywhere you like, pretty much, south of uh, 20 degrees north. So we can survey a very large part of the sky, or we can choose where we're looking from a very large part of the sky. What we've actually chosen to do uh, is we're scheduling uh, looking at galaxy clusters. That's my own particular science interest, is, is figuring out where the dark matter is around galaxy clusters. So we're going to look at 30 clusters which have been well studied with Hubble and some calibration, spectrophotometric calibration fields, and then look at 150 or so new ones as well. How am I doing on time? Um, one fun little, uh, fun little thing that we're doing as well is uh, that's just, just a bit of um, entertainment from this, is we're wondering how to get the data back down from a telescope that is whizzing around the Earth, or going where the wind takes it around the Earth. You can beam back down by uh, Iridium satellite phone. That's quite expensive. Uh, so we've taken a leaf out of the Cold War satellites book, uh, where they used to drop film canisters down. And we thought, oh, you know, we can do that. You can get a solid state drive, which is a modern film canister. And um, you know, whenever, whenever we pass over land, which happens fairly regularly in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, then you can, uh, you can drop one. So we've, we've been sort of having a bit of fun, really, uh, building some, uh, some hardware. It's a, it's a Raspberry Pi, so we can connect to it via, via Wi-Fi, download all the data onto it. It's connected to a little um, uh, tracker beacon, which actually just pings its location via Iridium. And we can then drop it. And we can download data from a, from a balloon by downloading <laughs> the data. <laughs> We've done this uh, on, on a few, uh, uh, weather from a few weather balloons. Here is uh, our little bit of uh, kit all wrapped in some foam to protect it during landing and running off to go and uh, get, the, get the parachute. Uh, with parachuting will work. Actually, it, it turns out at Durham we have a whole program to do um, uh, telescope calibration by flying drones over the top of them emitting, uh, emitting light sources. So we actually have quite a lot of expertise in flying drones. And our backup to the, to the, subtle, to the um, parachute drop download is to uh, put it inside a little foam glider and have it fly down. So this, uh, this telescope will fly around the world, and when you want to download the data, you just press the button, tell it where you are, and it, fly, uh, it copies the data onto, a, onto an aeroplane, and it flies down and lands at your feet. That's, uh, yeah, well, it's, it's been entertaining to having a go with all the hardware. Um, but I'm just going to leave you with some, con some conclusions that uh, this new ballooning technology, this new materials technology, has really reinvigorated the whole idea of ballooning as a way to get astronomical imaging avoiding the Earth's atmosphere. We've built on what actually used to be micro CMB, Cosmic Microwave Background Telescopes, technology for stabilising the pointing of a balloon, Turns out they were just doing a lot better than they needed to for a, for a microwave um, uh, PSF. The beam width, the pointing stability was a lot better than that. We've refined it a bit and got down to uh, uh, 20 milli arc second, certainly 50 milli arc second uh, pointing stability, so we can effectively have diffraction limited uh, telescope for anything up to a two meter class aperture. And the best thing is, when you find out that the mirror was not quite aligned, actually it wasn't during our first test flight, well, we don't need to uh, send up any astronauts to repair it. We got it back down again, realign the mirror, 
It now has actuators in it, so we can realign it in flight as well. But send it back up again with a new camera, and at the moment it does optical UV imaging, but really it could do anything that we uh, fit a suitable instrument for on the back of. And we are the next flight to fly on NASA's long-duration balloon program. So keep and peel. Question at the back here. Thank you. Fascinating. I want to ask a brief, serious question. But since you refer to the three fingers of God, <laughs> I can't help, I can't resist pointing out it might be better to refer to them as symbolizing the three claws on the paws of the dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, the serious question, would it be possible for the sake of cost and conserving a scarce and finite resource to use hydrogen, and would any differences in the thermal inertia properties of the gases be relevant if that was done? Um, Hindenburg. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> Hydrogen's explosive. <laughs> Hindenburg. <laughs> ah, the Hindenburg was safe. It only burnt because Count Hindenburg, a uh, Zeppelin, and his chemist designed the skin to be inflammable because they were anti-Hitlers, anti-Nazis, and wanted it to crash and burn. But nobody got hurt by the flames. The 12 victims drowned in the ballast water, so stop worrying. We, <laughs> we've had Brexit, we've had Brexit, Trump, and now Hitler. That's a, that's a trio, right. I'm my Three pillars of creation. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just, yeah. Okay. Ian was first. Uh, someone once told me from bitter experience that if you let your balloon go over Russia, it'll get shot down. Is, is that why basically all the long duration flights are in the southern hemisphere? Yeah. There are various launch facilities in the north, and um, they can go for a few days. That wasn't a problem until recently, because they could only stay up for a few days. But uh, if they keep going, then you don't get your ball back. Uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, there are basically no, there's no, uh, no countries with, uh, that, who are sort of <laughs> against it or, or, or who have the surface-to-air missiles to complain about it. <laughs> OK, for a slightly more serious question. <laughs> um, OK, if you increase the length of the tether to the balloon. Yeah. Right, OK, you can see closer to the zenith, but does it help you in terms of damping, in terms of the stability of the system, or does it make everything worse? Actually, a lot of that length is, um, the short answer is I don't know actually about the, uh, about the damping. That's a really interesting question. It's at the moment set by, it's just the standard, this is the, si the size of a parachute. We could pre actually presumably lengthen it. Um, we don't actually particularly care about not being able to see zenith. You have to look over, but um, you're above the atmosphere. So looking over at air mass two, it's two times almost nothing. So it really doesn't matter that you're looking sideways. It's slightly annoying in terms of scheduling. You have, we're developing algorithms to how to schedule a telescope where the telescope is moving, um, which is just sort of an extra free parameter in it, and can't look up. But that's just you know, an algorithm. That's, that's another fun bit to play with. Mm, yeah, exactly. For, um, for long integrations, presumably there are interruptions. Uh, and so the question is, when you break a long integration into multiple short integrations, mm. how repeatable is the PSF? And, you know, because stability of the PSF over a long integration must be one of the most important criteria, I would think. Yeah, for the, for the lensing. Um, we've had, we've done exposures up to... 10 minutes, just because we've only been flying uh, uh, one-night flights. The PSF, actually, in the 10-minute in the exposure that we've had was slightly dominated by the, uh, the telescope being, slight, being a bit out of alignment, that we, with, with only having a one-night flight, we didn't bother to get it perfectly aligned before we uh, went, just because that was taking a long time. That was actually quite stable. Um, I don't have the numbers for it in terms of the weak lensing 
numbers that, that, uh, that would be relevant to the science that we're going to do with it. Uh, but certainly the same, I don't know, qualitative shapes of the PSF were, were, were stable. The, there were various <laughs> modes that we see in the, uh, the, the undamped residual s swinging, uh, which adds to the um, <coughs> telescope's own diffraction limited or, or slightly out of alignment limited PSF. Those seem actually fairly repeatable over time that we have certain modes that are excited and not fully damped yet so we're still tweaking the control algorithms to uh, to damp it i mean the answer is qualitatively it's repeatable quantitatively yeah okay sorry i think we're gonna have to move on um richard is available afterwards during tea i'm sure yep.